people and uh, we were yeah it was a funny situation at the last minute um, you know yeah. but we suddenly said okay let's like just that. go so it's all good 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 great no i'm really excited about our uh, mental log because i think it's the last one today it is okay it seems like yes so uh, i don't think we will have uh, any others coming up so this is going oh. to be the last one so okay good so the, the best is for the last it could be the other way around too <laughs> <laughs> given that is... we had two two false starts right <laughs> well you know it's never too late and i think uh, yeah it's also about us setting expectations for ourselves <laughs> true true good so i think it's time already and i'm going to quickly then kick us off if that's okay for you make a absolutely you absolutely yes really absolutely okay good Great. So hello and welcome everyone to our final episode of Mentor Logs. Uh, my name is Kethki and I've had the privilege of uh, hosting the, the series for the last couple of months. Uh, today of course is a very special day because I am really privileged to 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 be discussing not only a very interesting topic for all of us which is being present uh, as part of our Mentor Logs series, but I also have a very special guest with me and um before i hand over the floor to to lekha i want to quickly introduce her so lekha is a is a global talent strategist and consultant in the area of leadership people success talent management and hr she carries with her almost four decades of rich global corporate experience amongst her recent corporate positions she was senior vp and head of talent at at wishworks with some total systems as vp for hr and talent management with Altruista as VP of People Success, with Zenoti as VP for Talent, and with GSS Infotech as Chief People Officer. And the list goes on. So as a talent strategist, her passion is to help people build the brand and increase value proposition for employers, employees, and individuals. Lekha is a recognized trainer, leadership mentor, and consultant, and has served as a global strategic consultant, also with the Accor Group of Dubai. Lekha has a long list of a lot of awards that she has won and uh, including the Indira Gandhi Priyadarshini award the HMA's HR manager of the year Asia Pack HR woman super achiever of the year and the most influential HR leader in India she was most recently listed among the top 100 global HR tech minds at the world hrd congress and in july 2019 she was recognized as a visionary woman leader of 2019 by the reputed business apac magazine published out of singapore wow lekha i am extremely impressed thank you thank you well after four decades of work experience i guess this is the least one can do no to have a couple of these feathers all over <laughs> well this is i i would say the pigeon is ready the feathers are so <laughs> i have a pigeon ready but uh, really and yeah. and that's why i think given that you have so many pigeons or or so many feathers in <laughs> pigeons ready i think how how did you manage to stay present because i would imagine that being present was really important part of you know creating or or you know earning these uh, feathers yeah absolutely i mean if you look at it um, ketaki half of what we do in hr is to connect with the other person right and not just with ourselves i think first of all to connect with ourselves and then to connect with the other person and you have to do that by being present by being in the moment it's not about the past it's not about the future of course somewhere in our niggling mind we would have perhaps some idea about where we'd like that person to go but in that moment of conversation in that moment of recognition of trying to encourage the other person to perform well we do focus on just being there at that time you know and uh, that's where i believe that it really depends a lot on understanding what is that locus of control okay so for instance you could say that uh, uh, you know we always say that there's something that we can change you remember that serenity prayer maybe uh, god grant me the serenity to accept the things i cannot change courage to change the things that i can and wisdom to know the difference and i think that is the power of the locus of control i have to understand what i can control in that conversation with the other person and only then be able to take them to the next level 
it's not correct for me to believe that you know whatever i say is definitely going to hit home and, and i have the you know the wizard's wand to be able to make the person change per se so we got to click the right button and enable that person to be able to understand themselves i think and then move forward so it's a lot about uh, you know external versus internal locus of control i'll give you an example uh, mm-hmm. when the pandemic hit right i mean we are talking about march in india um right. it was a huge change it was a huge change not only for all of us who are working women because we had to change the way in we are working the way in which we are interacting with people a lot of teachers had to suddenly learn to teach online where they were in a face to face class situation students especially when you look at india where you have a lot of students who are who haven't really been accustomed to studying online suddenly needed to go on to phones and then take on classes so that's really difficult and when you look at the uh, the entire way uh, i could have easily also allowed myself to get sucked into it right but uh, i realized that there was something i could do like this there is just that much that much that you can control and nothing else i can't control the pandemic i cannot control the organizations i cannot control the students but i can definitely control my own little world right so that Absolutely. that internal look so i can either say oh god why are these things happening to me and why should it you know and, and keep ruining the entire thing or i can say can i do something to be able to help things get better at least for myself if nothing so um i mean you know my history but i don't mind you know talking about it for the rest of the audience um i've had this huge weight problem for the last i don't know how many years 15 years right but during the pandemic as it came on i started thinking that okay is there something that i can do to be able to rectify use the situation to my advantage there's no cook right i mean you gave all the home staff off you have to manage the kitchen on your own so everything is un- un- under your control and i went on to this complete um, you know diet and i'm so happy to say that in the last 6 months i've managed to shed uh, one third of my weight okay so that's one person off my back <laughs> right but <laughs> what i'm saying is that it's possible for us to be able to take things in hand when we know what is in our control and what is not in our control so don't try and allow things to kind of get you down right and when i talk to people um, you know when we are even looking at mentoring for instance i remember what shivangi said and, and that comes back to mind but she said it's not about meditating but it's about doing things mindfully right it is about how does one really do things for now how does one do things at this moment how does one make the most of today rather than either like i said regretting the past or being worried about the future you can't change either of those things only to an extent you can always have a plan a and a plan b and a plan c but finally things will take their course right so when you sit back after you've made all the alternative arrangements you can only sit back and then wonder about how to get there right so so that's what i wanted to say about uh, you know the serenity and the the way in which one is in the moment being present even at work with people around you that's that's very interesting and you touched upon very interesting points uh, you know you know you talked about the locus of control but at the same time you also talked about um, you know being present and i think if you could help us understand a little bit around you know being present and how this local of con- control as a concept can be applied and and i know you've shared an example as well but i think just to kind of you know make, make it a little Absolutely. bit more compact and show the interlinkage really because i think like like you said being present somehow takes everyone to the concept of you know you being in a meditative or a spiritual uh practice which which is not what what we are saying because in mentoring being present has a very different meaning uh compared to when you talk about being present in a mindful situ- and being mindful in 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 everyday world so, so may, just help us understand that a little bit uh to give you an example again you know we all have this monkey mind right there's this constant chatter that goes on in our mind and i think all of us uh, tend to get driven away from the context of what this conversation that we are having for instance right my mind can keep on going into various other uh, areas so can yours as we are talking however 
if we are in the moment and i'm only looking at you i'm only connecting with you i am rephrasing what you're saying you are affirming what you hear from me there's obviously more of a connect when we are being present in that particular situation and not allowing our monkey mind that that mindless chatter to continue to take over right so in in mentoring it is so essential that we actually stick with the person right so we connect on so many fronts whether it is visual or it is kinesthetic it is auditory i'm just reading your body language as you're sitting right now the fact that you know your eyes are moving from right to left and obviously you're looking at the chat and you know try to figure out if there are any questions coming so i know that you are in the moment you're not doing something else right for me that is important otherwise what can happen is that i will immediately go off into another l you know the ladder of inference you know i'll i'll give you an example like yesterday you know what happened between you and me right i mean uh i had to ask someone to connect with you to tell you that we may not be able to do the session today and what did you think at that time i i was under the impression that well i i one part i wanted to believe you because i know that at this time of the year the you know the weather is very unpredictable but at the other at the, on the other side of course you know this was the second time that you know <laughs> i was hearing this so again it's i think it's just human to to say like wow what's going on <laughs> that's right you know so what what happens here is that there was if i could look at it there was an objective statement that you heard right not directly from me from somebody else that there is a postponement your mind immediately went on to the selected fact that you've done it before she's doing it again she's not interested in thrive why does it happen for thrive only right and then you went you put another meaning to it and then you said you know maybe thrive doesn't matter to her and then you had an assumption maybe i don't matter to her and then you went to this conclusion that you know i'm actually feeling a little offended well it didn't happen to you but i'm saying that that's where it could go that you know you feel offended and because of that you say okay i'm now disinterested i don't know whether this is going to happen or it's not going to happen it's okay and then the action that happens after that is that you're not even going to go ahead and you you know look for the next meeting date right it didn't happen right because i managed to get hold of you and you know immediately tell you okay the current is back on now if you had reaffirmed with me for example um you know right at that out and i'm sure you would have done it a little later if you had reaffirmed you would have realized that hyderabad was being battered we've been battered for the last 3 days in india you know the the, the central the center of the deccan peninsula has been hit by this huge torrential storm and we've had houses under 6 to 7 feet of water a lot of people cars piling on to one another with the gushing of water can you imagine and obviously power went down uh, the internet went down and i was wondering how am i going to be able to connect and i definitely didn't want it to be another case like you know we're not able to even hear each other and so i was wondering and wondering what it was that i could do and that is why i had done this but i understand that ladder of inference that happens if i am not present with you at that time and you are not present with me it's very easy for us to make an assumption that could allow that entire relationship to get completely hijacked you know but we need to be present we need to be right there in that moment i'll give you another example for instance you know let's take the fact that um, you know i made this very interesting dish okay for lunch and um, say the other person whoever is in the house turns around and says oh that's a very interesting dish and i say after all that hard work the only the only thing the person can say is interesting yeah. and then i say okay maybe he doesn't think that he or she doesn't think that i'm in a you know i'm a good cook and so i'm saying that the meaning that i'm putting in my mind is that it's not a nice dish right and therefore there's this assumption so he doesn't like my food and if he doesn't like my food now i take it as an insult right there's that belief and what is my conclusion i have this long face and i will sit around you know completely grumpy about the entire thing and the action that happens after that is i'm not going to be cooking next time so you see what happens is if we allow this ladder of inference to go ahead without me continually asking the question and figuring out or even testing my assumption then i'm only making like we say assume is nothing but making an ass of you and me you and me. right that is that is what assume stands for so we need to be able to ask the questions be in the moment allow all our senses to be able to take on whatever that conversation is because especially with a mentee i think we need to understand that the mentee doesn't often say what they want right at the outset right there's so much under the surface the undercurrent 
And we as mentors need to be very sensitive to those undercurrents. We need to know, okay, what exactly is that person feeling? What is the person trying to say? Where would the person like to go next? Instead of, I see what happens sometimes is that, you know, you, you have these, in your mind, pearls of wisdom, right? And you immediately want to share those pearls of wisdom with the other person because you think being a mentor is out here and being a mentee is up down here. It's not true. We are on the same relationship. In fact, the mentor, a mentoring relationship is such that, you know, it's a lot of learning on both sides. And what I know or what I have experienced, though it has been maybe 40 years of work experience, may not be applicable to that person in their situation today because the environment has changed. Their context is different. That person is different. I am different, right? So I think what needs to happen in a mentoring relationship is to be present so that we are picking up on all these flavors of that communication and trying to understand what is the need of the person. But like I've always said, you know, and I heard this somewhere else and I thought it was a very interesting way to put mentoring. And I said, the mentor is like a well. You know, whatever the kind of experience that the person has, so much of experience. But it is up to the mentee at that time to take hold or control of the situation and go to the well and draw out what they want from that mentor. So the mentor is not going to come out of the well and drop the water into the lap of the mentee, right? The mentee needs to pick it up. And it could be with a small mug, it could be with a glass, it could be with a bucket, it could be with a pail. It depends. How much of water are you willing to draw out at which time? And what kind of water do you want at that time? Is it about, you know, what you'd like to do or where you'd like to go or whether you're in the, on the right track? Because I think one of the things that we often confuse ourselves with as mentors is the difference between mentoring and coaching right for me mm -hmm. mentoring is a long-term thing it is about am i helping the person to be able to probably develop themselves towards a long-term career what 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 can their strengths be how can i help them to leverage that to take advantage of opportunities in the future whereas coaching is more about helping them to solve a problem you know becoming a better manager dealing with a particular company being able to get to a particular point and so on so I, I think if we as mentors can recognize that we need to respond to the mentor, mentee and the needs of the mentee as they may speak or they may not speak, we've got to delve beneath the surface. Then you have to be there. There's, you don't have an option. You just need to be there. You know, one of the things like, for instance, is don't, um, you know, don't say that you want to do mentoring. You've got to be a mentor, which means that you, you have to carve that time right? You can't just say, okay, I have this mentoring hour and let me quickly slot it between five and six in the evening. And hopefully there's nothing else that comes up. If there's something that comes up, I can always postpone the mentoring. No, you have to carve it in solid stone for that mentee, for that mentee, because the mentee needs to recognize that they are important, right? And therefore there's a lot about being present. It's so much about understanding the psyche of the other person and to do that, you also have to be very empathetic. And by being empathetic, I'm saying, you know, like Daniel Goldman says in his uh, emotional intelligence, he says, take off your shoes before you want to step into the other person's shoes. You can't put on your persona and then try to get into the shoes of the other person. Therefore, I need to understand my mentee. I need to understand what is their psyche? What are they bringing to the table? What are their difficulties? What are their inner conflicts that they are? And are they willing to talk about it? And they may not even be. But still, am I able to, therefore, bring it up to the surface to an extent where I'm able to help them to, you know, see the mirror and just be able to say, okay, so this is why I'm feeling what I am and help them to be able to reach their solution on their own. Because like I said, your solution may not be the best solution. Their solution is very different from yours. Absolutely. So that's what I mean by, by being yeah. present in a mentoring relationship. Absolutely. I, I do want to mention that uh, guys who are watching us on Facebook and that I, I know that people have been sending likes and hearts. So, you know, Lekha, people are loving what you're saying, especially the well analogy. That's a favorite for me already. And I'm seeing a lot of action on Facebook. So please, please feel free to post your questions on Facebook and um, we will be happy to take them up uh, alongside or at the end, depending on how contextual they are. But Lekha, I want to come back to one of the points that you talked, you know, mentioned, which was about this um, concept of mental chatter. And that's, of course, something which is always by our side uh, that usually never really leaves us, even though, you know, we try sometimes very hard. And, and I guess when, when as a mentor or a mentee, that 
also comes along with us, right? So at the beginning of every session, most likely this mental chatter from obviously all the life that we are living is going on. So how in the how how have have you managed to in the beginning of a session, or what do you suggest mentors do or mentees do to be able to come into the moment and like really leave everything outside? So before they enter, the mentor enters the mentee's shoes and vice versa. How can you leave everything at the door and be present um, for that conversation to, to really start that's, afresh? That's a wonderful point, KTK. Very, very, very important, in fact. Because you see what happens is, remember, you've been through an entire day, right? And by the time you're coming to that uh, mentoring session, you've already had a lot of items that have been on your mind, on your plate. You've probably done well, not done well. You're, you're continuously thinking about it. But I believe that one needs to, um, you know, and, and, and this is what I do, by the way. I just make a, a journal, like a kind of a scratch pad, and I say, recollect whatever there was in the previous mentoring, um, you know, probably the appointments that I've had with that particular mentee, quickly recapture what it was, get myself down to speed, and then probably say, okay, so what we're going to be talking today about is what are the questions I need to ask the person? And because of that kind of, uh, frame of mind I have already removed the chatter there is an intent right so that intent is to get into that mentoring relationship with a positive urge to help the other person I have to leave it behind at the door everything else and I like the fact that you use the door because I use the analogy of a door jam you know so I say when I'm entering a new appointment this is the door and I've actually hung my bucket or my basket or my bag of all other items that are there in my mind right now are there. I'm entering this room or this appointment only focused on what this is. So when I do that, automatically I've already, I said, I'm going to pick up that bag later. It's not that I've done away with it. I'm not throwing it away. But for this next one hour or one hour, 15 minutes, because 15 minutes before the session, you will always prepare. And then I say, okay, for the next one and a half hours or one hour, 15 minutes, I'm going to be focused completely on Ketuki, right? So I'm just going to be focused on Ketuki, what she wants out of me, what I expect to be able to give her. I don't know. It could change. But do I know about what is her problem or what is her issue or what is her challenge? And can I therefore try to help her? And I think putting it down is a very good way. The other thing also to remove this mental chatter is something that I do, which is at the end of the session, again, I write it down mm -hmm. and I leave it as notes, right? So then you know that you've been in the moment at that time. Remember, you need these notes for the next appointment. So you need to be able to make those notes and keep it away at that time and then go back out and pick up that bag on the door jam, right? And then you can face the rest of your day. This is another thing that actually as a practice session, I would like, you know, even mentees to be able to come with that kind of frame to remove that chatter from your mind. And it's not very easy. It really does take a lot of practice, like you say, right? Your mind is your mind is a monkey. What can it do? It's going to keep jumping from branch to branch and it's going to, you know, uh, it's going to have fun. So you need to be able to look at what you can do better to remain focused and remain persistent. And the little, little things, you know, like that, for instance, um, another thing that I do is uh, when I'm having my cup of coffee, I create a diary of my entire day. And while I'm doing that morning cup of coffee, while I'm doing that, there's an intent besides every appointment, right? So I'm going to do this. This is the intent of it. I'm going to meet so-and-so. This is the intent of it. I might have other chatter in my mind. I will write that too. So while I'm talking, whatever is going through my mind, keep writing it, keep writing it. And at the end of the day, you do a review of your day and say, all right, so how much has the monkey chatter really deflected me from the rest of the intent that I had at the start of my day? And I think that will take you a long way, right? And little things like, for instance, I could give you an example. Uh, one of the ways to be able to train your mind to stay focused is, and this happens a lot to children, right? When you're with a child and um, the child, the children really help you to stay focused. So if you're going for a drive, they say, oh, look at this. Oh, look at that, you know. And I, I, I've learned that. For instance, uh, if you're going for a walk, think of a number. Okay. So you think okay. of a number and let's say it's five. And while you're on your walk, you're going to keep looking for five. So it could be five uh, petal flower. It could be five stones in a particular place. It could be five branches of a tree that that impact you it could be a shape that is created by five clouds it could be five blades of grass 
bedding together. So you're looking for that number five in whatever you're doing. And you really are in the moment of that work. You're not allowing something else to go away from you because you're, you're applying that one mind, that one name, that one number to that particular activity. There's another, another thing I could tell you that right now. Ketiki, um, close your eyes and tell me what your favorite color is. Pink. Okay. Can you quickly tell me all the pinks that you see around you right now? You can look around the room. Well, I'm wearing a pink jacket. And yes. I see there's pink in the background. Right, right. <laughs> I see you're wearing pink. Yes. Okay. And um, yeah, that's pretty much what I see so far. Okay. Okay. So there is a lot of pink, right? That is already there. And how did your eye pick out that instead of the chatter that is there of the blues and the yellows that I can see in the beautiful frames that they are behind you? Because you trained your mind to be able to look for something at that moment. So whenever it is and whatever it is, keep training your mind, reframe it. Like, you know, put your watch on the other side. And every time you do that, put it on the other hand and, and start. And I remember Sonia saying something like that in her session where she said, you know, to be able to write with the other hand right or to be able to feed yourself with the other hand reframing it reframing your natural impulses or whatever you usually do into a different kind of behavior actually opens your mind it rewires your mind to think differently and that's where the experience is come you know mirroring Absolutely. you know mirroring for instance every time i do a selfie i always forget that this is the way i see myself in the mirror right so i always forget to turn it around flip it around when i'm sending it out Okay. You understand? Because, right. because especially for saris, there is a particular shoulder that you put your sari on, right? It's right. the left shoulder. But when I send the picture across, it's always the right because it was a selfie. Correct. But I need to rewire it to be able to say that's not the way I do it because my eye sees me in the picture or in the mirror the way right. in which it would be in a selfie. So we need to keep on rephrasing, reframing, you know, keep keep doing little tricks with our mind to be able to ensure that we can be in the moment and we can train our mind to just stay focused. That's so important. That's, I think that is the need of the hour today because I think being present during COVID times, I think that's where most people have struggled. I think with parents, for example, where you know homeschooling has been quite a challenge for most parents. Um, and, and I'm sure, you know, other people, whether you're living alone or people, you know, with who are in a couple relationship, I think everyone has had something or the other that they have realized either about themselves, that what works for them and what doesn't. And, you know, and especially because in, in India or in any other part of the world, because of the lockdowns, you know, there isn't so much space that we could even use, physical space that we could even use to to say, you know, this is now me trying to be present and focus on something else because it seems like people are just drowning under the torrential rains of COVID. <laughs> so it's not yeah. just limited to the, the okay. physical rains. Not a good example with the rains of Hyderabad right now. <laughs> torrential rains of COVID. But, you know, I get what you're saying and it's so true. My daughter who's in Dubai and she's got two young children. She has a big problem herself. She says, you know, I cannot wait for the schools to open because I haven't, I haven't respected the teachers as much as I do now, you know. I'm ready to, to, to give them away, to give the children away. Um, you know, and I think the, the COVID has actually, the pandemic has actually brought out a huge new uh, challenge for women, I would say. Because remember, even though the husband is at home, I'm talking about India, Okay, I know it's very different in many places and in India also it's changing. So while I'm making a general statement, I, you know, one has to understand that there can always be exceptions, right? So I'm going to take cover under the fact that there can be exceptions. Absolutely. But, um, but, you know, most women have a problem because they're in the middle of their meeting. They usually used to have a household help earlier or, you know, somebody else, an, an older mother or a mother-in-law who was at home with them. Now the mothers and the children have to be kept, the elders and the children have to get, be kept separate because obviously the mothers have, you know, the, the pre-morbidities and the higher risk for them. So you keep them away. And you have to look after the child. You, you have to sit with the homeschooling. You are also in a call. Your husband on, is on his own call in the other room. How do you focus? Where do you get that time? You know, and, and you are constantly, as it is, we have the imposter syndrome right? Most women. And we're saying, you know, I cannot afford 
to even allow somebody else to think that I am not determined or I'm not dedicated to what I'm doing. And therefore, I cannot say that, okay, I'm getting confused and I, I need to take some time off or tell the child, no, 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 don't play with that wire or don't do this or sit down with your books in the middle of a call, in the middle of an official call. So the, the wife, the mother, the woman of the house has actually been under tremendous stress. And we're getting a lot of calls by uh, women, not only about depression, but a high degree of frustration, of anger, of rage sometimes, and they don't know how to be able to tackle. So I, I think that that's one. The second thing is, uh, I wanted to give an example of, you know, um, fathers. Fathers are constantly around children but they're not with children. There is a difference. Yeah. Right? They yeah. can be around the child at home, but they're not doing things actively with the child. And I'll give you one more example. I lost my father. In fact, yesterday was his 12th death anniversary, right? So uh, 12 years back in 2008. And uh, he was my idol, right? Um, and I realized that at the time that he was actually in hospital, um, dying, uh, I realized I had not been with him. I had been around him. I had not taken enough time to be with him. Now, of course, I've gone the other way. Okay, so I lost him. And immediately at that time, I realized that I've got to do something to get more flexibility into my work. And after that, of course, I've been with my mother, my mother's been with me. And now my entire focus is her. In fact, I think sometimes I may be actually, you know, suffocating her quite a bit because <laughs> I'm so anxious that she shouldn't really feel that, you know, I'm neglecting her like the way in which I think I neglected my father. So we do a lot of things together and we are in the moment together. So we go on holidays, we've gone bungee jumping, we've done parasailing, you know, we've gone on Changu Lake uh, uh, walked on it together and my mother is very petite and tiny and um, you know she needs to be taken care of she has a heart problem but I constantly am doing things with her because I think that is what the pandemic and other life events often make us realize that there are things which are more important so where, where is our value and what are the items that are more critical for us right so those are the kind of uh, issues that I wanted to talk about when we're looking at um, the pandemic and uh, the COVID and the kind of stresses and strains that we have. And I think as mentors, one needs to recognize that I, I have a mentee, for instance, in the UK. I know her situation is very different from mine, right? I need mm -hmm. to be able to understand it. She's still under stress, but it's a different kind of stress from what other women here are. So I can't go in there making an assumption, oh, I know what she's going through because I do not. Right. So so we really need to keep stepping into people's shoes, understanding them and also in the bargain, I think, humanizing ourselves too often. We consider that, you know, we we need to be able to be superstars in the mentee's mind. No, I think the failure concept is something that the mentee learns more from than the success. You can't put yourself up there on a pedestal. I'll give you an example that happened recently. One of the. Um, one of the mentors was, uh, who's an entrepreneur, was with another uh, mentee who's also an entrepreneur. And mm -hmm. they, uh, you know, every time they spoke, uh, the mentee kept feeling that the entrepreneur needs a lot more. The, the mentor needs to tell me about the, the changes, the difficulties, the challenges that they've had. And every time the mentor spoke, they were only talking about the fact about how they succeeded in their, you know, in their life. And the frustration had got so much that finally I had to intervene and we needed to be able to let people see the other side. And I think this, this, this characteristic of humanizing ourselves is so important in the mentee's mind. So we can't talk down to a person. We need to be there with the person and let them know that, you know, I can understand your challenges may be different, but I've had challenges too. This is what I had done. Maybe you can pick up from it, but it may not work for you. So let's, let's talk about your alternatives. So I think that humanizing is again another factor of being present in That's the entire situation. Absolutely true. And I'm seeing some activity on Facebook as well. And people are really appreciating some of the examples that you're sharing, Lekha. And I've seen Geeta Murthy Iyer has been quite active and she's really 
first of all she's hoping that you have power restored well we can see that <laughs> <laughs> yes i do <laughs> luckily but i'm connected on the inverter as well just in case yes thank ah, you geeta thank you <laughs> and also she talks about uh, you know relating to the covid situation when she says especially when working from home the three of us have calls scheduled at the same time and physical space is such a challenge to be present so i think um, everyone is feeling the heat of it and i guess some of the tips that you've shared you know about being human uh, whether in a mentor mentee relationship but also you know with the family in 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 limited physical space uh, so to speak um how, what are the, some of the tips including you know writing a journal scripting being intentional i think these are really fantastic tips that all of us can can leverage and use but but I'd that like also i'd like to give one more Can I give one more tip to of Geeta course, because of, of the course. point that she spoke about and the one that you had raised about having these limited spaces in which everybody is taking calls? I think it's important for uh, uh, you know the woman to actually speak to her partner also and to the children and and give them an activity if the call is really important and if there's no way that the husband can also get away at that time, give the child an activity which is going to engage before you get into the call. Right? That's one point. Secondly, I think it's fine to let the husband. no that there is this call and it's going to take you about 20 minutes so can he spare 20 minutes of his time and the third thing is again like i said humanize yourself it's okay to humanize yourself to your managers and today managers understand this because remember whether it's a man or a woman who is a manager they are facing the same kind of challenges at home so i think it's fine to be able to turn around to that manager and to be able to tell him that you know what i may not be able to take the call at this time is it possible for me to do probably reschedule it maybe 5 o'clock in the evening or 6 o'clock in the evening or there's school that's on right now and i need to sit with the child and i'm sure they would be able to understand so i think it's important for us to connect you know and let out our failures let out our challenges our own internal issues it's fine it's not going to make you look weaker it's going to make you look stronger because they will understand that you're juggling so many items and a woman does not need to be a superwoman at all times i you know it's okay to to fail it's okay not to bring dinner on the table at at 8 o'clock you know it's fine so i think it's i think failing is part of the game right fail and, and enjoy the failure the exactly and i think it it has a little bit to do with how we define failure i would imagine right and i think it's also to do with expectation but of course you know if we've been doing certain things with habit there are certain kinds of expectations and which is why it's so important to constantly be mixing the spices a little bit uh, not only in the food but also in life i think right so absolutely it's it's so important right and talking about mixing spices it's a good idea to allow the husband to mix the spices maybe he'll start cooking as well right well, hopefully <laughs> covid has encouraged that to happen but uh, yeah. but we will we are waiting to to hear more from the from the audience for more questions uh, and and your your examples as well actually so so while we are we are hearing from the audience i do want to ask you lekha as well because of course you know we we talked about this very briefly about you know being present really means that you know you leave the the day's activities at the door and you really come into the room and i think that was very possible in a very physical world and we live of course in a very virtual world and so one is of course i'd love to know what is it that you do to be physically uh, but virtually present <laughs> yeah. but also uh, how are you you know leveraging um, the technology for example maybe to 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 change some of your habits um, as well so one of the things i think is to of course every time you have a calendar invite please fix it for 15 minutes beforehand right your alarm has to go off 15 minutes beforehand so that you're ready you know that you blocked that time off so for instance today while our session started at 7 i was here by about 6:45 already getting into the frame of what i needed to do so from about 6:30 onwards i 6:30 india time i was already sitting and you know working out what else needs to be done so i had to lock the front door i had to give my mom her dinner and things like that so these kind of items get it out of the way so that you're in right the other thing is of course be present by way of for instance feel the table you know be very present feel the floor under your feet feel the chair i would keep a rock a soft rock feel that rock you know pull your mind back to the to the time that you are and allow that tactile sensation to drive your mind back to where you are at that time so think about different ways like that you know for instance i 
read uh, a little bit more about um, you know what Sonia had spoken about I did flip through the power of now by Katole and I thought it was so relevant to the topic and I always loved him of course but I think reading it today brought in a new frame you know uh, to to what we're going to be talking so I think that those are the kind of things that you will take to be able to be present at this time and like I said that ladder of inference right it's so important and, and not allowing assumptions to get away with us for instance, you know, if I know um, people are on the call, for instance, that's good. I'm glad that they are interested. It does not need to make me anxious, right? It needs to make me anxious to know what they're thinking, as I'm saying. So it's nice to be able to get the smiles and, you know, the hearts and, and stuff like that and also get the reflection. So in, a tacti in, in an online world, I think things like what Geeta is doing, where she's reflecting upon the examples, tells me that she's present in the moment. And I think we need to use those affirmations with us more and more. So while I spoke of the door jam, it can be in, an, in a real world. It would be a bridge, you know, from Hyderabad to Sikandrabad, there's a bridge, a big paid bridge. So I usually use that to be able to, to uh, focus on what can be, uh, you know, part of uh, what I'm leaving behind, what I'm taking to work, what I'm coming back, etc. So I think you need to figure out it may not be a door jam. It could be anything. It could be just, a, okay, I'm dropping that off. I've got a worry. I'm dropping it off. And it's not that nobody has a worry, right? There's always something that is going to be there. I see a question from Melinda. Would you like? To exactly. Melinda, would you like to, to uh, un going come on to the video? Unmute yourself. And unmute yourself. Exactly. Can you come on video as well, possibly? Uh, I believe you have to you have to start that for me. I do. Okay, let yeah. me quickly. But I will, in the interest of time, I'll begin asking the question of Lekka. Thank you so much for sharing these ideas with us. Wow, I have so much scribbled down in front of me. <laughs> um, I'm just asking to, if we could go back slightly to when we began the conversation. You know, you, you referenced identifying and focusing on what we can control versus what we can't control, which is, you know, sage advice. Personally, I feel as though the current situation around the world, the pandemic, everything that goes with that has possibly led me to going a little bit too far in that direction. So I'm feeling like I must control something you know there's this sort of burning desire to whatever it is I can do I have to do it and and I'm conscious that it's possibly it, it could be shared and experienced by many women out there that it could go a little too far in that direction you know you to, to become not obsessive but but that in that in that direction could you offer some insights um, around how how to soften that intention to help still have an idea of self-care <laughs> around the, that need to control what we must control Thank you, Melinda. Wonderful, um, you know, question. And I think it makes me think a lot, which is why I, I think it's very appreciative. Um, you see what happens, and you're right, you know, when there's so much that's happening around you, obviously, there is this feeling of getting overwhelmed. And then you're wondering, okay, I, I can't just allow myself to drown under this, I've got to be able to control something or the other. And then we do tend to become more aggressive, we tend to become more assertive in a lot of Asia, a lot of uh, areas. And probably, you know, that could also damage our relationship. Supposing we do this internally. Supposing we say, all right, can I control the pandemic? I cannot, right? But what can I do about it? So I will take all the precautions. So there will be the masks that are ready. There will be the sanitization. There is the, the, the gloves, which are going to be there. I'm going to stay with, you know, that distance of six feet. I'm going to ensure that my mother who has a pre morbidity is not going to go out. I'm staying home with her. I'm going to be transferring all my work online. So there are these alternative solutions which are there in my mind. I cannot control the situation, but I can control what I can do to respond to that situation. That's point number one. Secondly, supposing I now take it internally, right? So I said, external, you can't do much about. Internal, I make things happen. So it could be like I have told you about myself that I use the pandemic to be able to get hold of my health. And to be able to ensure, because I had practically, Melinda, I had gone into a stage where I was, you know, choosing my flights based on not climbing stairs. So I would choose flights which actually had a ramp to get into the to the aircraft. I would choose resorts where I would get definitely, a, a, you know, a room on the ground floor. 
it was actually stultifying me in so many ways i was i was losing the way i would love to enjoy life and then i realized that this is a perfect time i can't do anything about the situation outside but the the fact that i was traveling earlier about 5 to 5 and a half hours a day to and from work right by office i stay in the northeast of hyderabad and my office is exactly at the south west of hyderabad i was taking 2 hours in the morning and 3 3 and a half hours in the evening to get back home and i said this is a saving of time what do i do to be able to utilize this well right so earlier i used to be reading probably in the car while i was being driven now you don't even have the 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 case of a driver you're not getting out of the house but i do have 5 hours and i said what can i do so i started reading about you know what i can do to better my my own health so there was a controllable that i created which therefore helped me to be in charge of something which was probably something that i was longing for a long time back for a very very long time honestly for i i would say for the last 30 years i've been truly suffering right but now i feel i'm in control and in fact it came to a point that you know i actually was waiting for the pandemic the lockdowns that we have in india to actually not get over too soon because i didn't want my goal not to be met right? <laughs> that is one point so look for things that you can control within yourself work on a new skill learn crochet learn probably how to sing um you know i saw uh, these i don't know whether you've seen these two cellos that the artist yes, and uh, mm. yeah i yeah. mean he's he's such a fabulous guy but anyway if you've seen the way in which he strums his cello you know with with uh, the girl sitting uh, on the same chair think about doing something like that with your partner you know is it possible uh, i mean just just be innovative look about look at what you can control and give your life a new meaning and that will help you to feel happier there will be things that you can do so therefore look internally i don't know whether i've made sense melinda no absolutely you have and i think i think if i reflect on that the things that i'm identifying as oh i can control this they're they're other they're not me that i can control this for my family i can control this for work i can control this for but uh for me and to to bring some sort of joy and and freedom and growth for me that's probably not what i've been focused on so you know that's that's wonderful insight thank you pleasure thank you so much belinda thank you for asking that question as well Really nice. I want to. I want to actually. You know, of course, uh, more questions. Uh, hopefully, all also coming up on Facebook as we we continue the conversation. But uh, thank you, Melinda, as well for the for the nice question. I I do want to focus a little bit on the idea of mind chatter because I think um, and and I know we've really touched upon it already. But I think um, th- there are people who really struggle with it, right? So now let's forget. You know what's happening around us. which is which is usually the case for the mind chatter but i just i'm just saying because mind chatter comes in the way of 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 being present as well um right. so not just you know the activity around us which is ex- external to us which we cannot control but the mm-hmm. the chatter within us which and the imposter syndrome for example that you also touched upon very briefly so i just want to to share with the audience for example what is it that how have you managed to to let go of, especially of the negative thoughts that tend to bring us down uh irrespective of what the external environment might be because this is something that we can control right so this is in our in our hands to manage absolutely beautiful question and i want to refer to the third l okay so we spoke of two l if you remember we spoke of the locus of control and we spoke of the ladder of influence i want to speak about the third l and this is the law of attraction and i am a strong believer in being positive okay you will rarely find me talking negative right i mean i might think negative i might feel negative internally but you'll rarely find me talking or sharing things which are negative because i believe there's so much of negativity already in the world right you can make fun of somebody you can make fun of yourself that's fine right i mean you can laugh at things which are going wrong but you don't need to keep on ruining the fact that things are going wrong and i believe that if you are positive and you think and you visualize very strongly that there's something that intent that we spoke about earlier when you're going mm-hmm. into your day if you can create that intent and visualize the the net result what is it that you want at the end of it the world will make it possible for you to achieve that and i have found that happening again and again 
so please attract positive thoughts be positive about it you know it it it's so strong in me um ketki that there are times when my best friends when i find them are very negative when they are very negative about whatever you know a politics in the in the country or whatever we're not going the right direction in many ways in india for example um but i don't dwell on it first of all it's not something i can control i can only cast my vote and there's some time away for that right so why not look for things that are going right right so therefore you can you can and there are there's plenty that is going right so why don't we look for that and then visualize that strongly enough to take over a large part of what you're doing i know this sounds very um, what should i say ideal but it can happen you just need to practice it uh, far enough so want the positive think about the positive surround yourself with positivity laugh you know joke do whatever you want uh, laugh at yourself that's fine uh, get a little playful and i think the mental chatter starts quieting down like for instance when you meditate in the morning let's say you're doing yoga and you'd like to meditate start off with a little bit of deep breathing you will realize that you know your mind is going all over how do you focus on any one thing right so it's just talking about this talking about that but that's fine let it converse it's okay you're still in the moment you're still in the moment with your mind you're not looking at other distractions around you and your mind will quieten down over time you just need to be able to train it all right you've dealt with that situation you've dealt with this okay the mind is telling you about this the mind is telling you about this it's fine but over time you will come down to the semblance of peace and it's okay to allow that little bit of a chatter in and out but not when you're in a conversation with another person because you see when when we're talking about this chatter we have to understand this being present really has uh, a lot of advantages right i mean you can look at it by way of if you look at your performance and you say that i'm going to be my memory improves because you're in the moment mm-hmm. your your performance definitely improves in all ways because you're you're currently completely focused on what you're doing so your focus is better you're able to make better decisions because you're collecting whatever is required to make that decision at that time and so on and if you look at the other side externally again being mindful or being present or you know allowing this this mindless chatter to to calm down allows you to be with the other person to create that relationship that's better to make sure that you can negotiate you understand you empathize you're able to allow that conflict resolution to happen even before there is a conflict right so you're able to like for instance yesterday coming back to that example why did i immediately pick up the call and speak to you because i i i knew what you must be going through at that time right Absolutely. so when you empathize with the other person you're already setting the the game plan you're saying all right so i know that this is this could be a problem how do i how do i work with it to be able to ensure that things are going to be smoother right and and i think um, you know you connect you align perfectly with the mind of the other person um i am with you at this time right and i'm appreciating you for what you're doing and i think that connect will definitely carry forward in in a relationship so both by way of your own performance as well as also by way of relationship being mindful and calming that mindless chatter is definitely going to help it does take practice i'm not saying it's easy it does take practice but it can happen there are many times in class i don't know kitki have you ever taught in a school um yes i have taught to young children yes i have so do you realize how much they chatter <laughs> all the time right the and time. not only by the mouth i mean their eyes are constantly doing this and that etc so i teach even now all through my 40 years in fact for the last i would say 25 26 years i have been teaching at the mba level so on weekends i'm usually teaching right and you know even in a class full of 180 students who are taking your course you're standing out there you can make out when a student is not present right right so they are staring at you like this <laughs> but they're not with you they're thinking of a movie they've gone to or what they're going to do after class right so it's very important for you to be able to be clever enough to catch that nuance and pull them back So you know how students are right i mean when you ask them a question 
they very often have the ostrich syndrome. No, <laughs> they will not look at you when you ask the question. You call out the name, and the person somewhere else. They suddenly, you know, they they're looking for their legs. Have they got lost or something? Right. So that ostrich syndrome, you need to be able to get over it. So you go very close to them and you say, "Hey, by the way, Heyman, you know, this is a question that was focused at you. What do you think about it?" And you repeat the question so he doesn't get embarrassed with the others, but he is pulled back. so i think you need to be able to do that mindless chatter and controlling of the situation also with other people yeah absolutely and i think being i guess being a teacher has given you a little bit more practice over the others where you they don't need to necessarily control the attention but i think as parents probably they also need to control the attention of their children and i think this is a very important you know skill to learn to be able to bring well yourselves uh, of course in the moment but also you know parenting is probably teaching the people as well to to do that for not only for themselves but also for their children although i think it is difficult to actually control other people whether it's your children or uh, partners or you know relatives and parents as well so so i think th- that is definitely a bit challenging um so you touched upon a very interesting point and i i do think that that's important for for you to share your you know insights as well around the body language because you know you you talked about an example in the physical space but maybe you want to share examples from both perspectives where when you see people who are either not present or and that how besides of course calling them out what are some other ways that you have tried to be present or help someone become present in physical spaces also in virtual spaces um i think melinda is asking the same question as well how yeah. might we we help people meet up in the moment if they have zoned out absolutely so you know what we need to do i think especially in the virtual space is to be able to call out examples which can relate to them right so when i'm talking to my students for example since they're all gen y and gen z which is two generational cohorts below me two or three in fact um what i need to do is to be able to you know tell them about things that interest them so it might be an example from cricket and you know cricket is a nat- national sport in india okay <laughs> and or or it could be from film and could be a film that is um that i know is something which they like but which i do not like my generation we talk about things which are very very important for them at that point in time and when you do that their attention starts coming back so i think don't allow them to zone out keep getting them back into the moment and therefore we say you know that every like the digital native that gen z and gen y are are people who are so into uh, computers and phones etc that they can talk better to a computer or through the keyboard than they can to face to face but yeah. we aren't like that right we are digital immigrants and therefore what we do is keep calling them out keep keep bringing back their attention span is not more than 3 minutes at a time so every 3 minutes you've got to do something which is going to you know either you know like a mental dance right uh, a joke a laugh you got to help them to come back through a show of emotion which is going to have to make them respond in that time as, as well and the same thing happens even in a classroom right you can be talking about a very important concept but i cannot talk about the concept for more than 3 minutes i've got to i've got to get them back so the way i would do it is i would ask them an example what happened in the you know the industrial disaster that happened last week i mean what would you have done in that situation and so on so i think the important thing is to to continuously reflect and allow them to reflect and in their reflection pull them back so uh, melinda to your question as well when people have to meet us when we are with them and you feel that they have zoned out i think connecting with them on a you know with a situation that that helps them uh, that that is theirs not yours that is important and it will pull them back i hope i made that yeah, clear yeah that's wonderful thank you thank you yeah and and any any last any last tips uh, lekha from your perspective uh, around how to be present um uh, yeah i i think the the most important thing is for a mentor please keep challenging the mentee keep challenging the mentee to think new not challenging by way of conflict but you know help the mentee to go beyond what they would have otherwise thought so when you're showing the mirror 
also deflect it a bit so that they see other possibilities which otherwise they may never have seen because it's only you're otherwise only seeing yourself i think make them go beyond what they think is possible for themselves um secondly i think very important is don't try to rush with your pearls of wisdom like i said you know uh, please don't listen to respond listen to understand i think that that's a very the key factor and don't assume don't assume you know it all you do not their situation is very different from yours like i always say you know when you when you're playing with kites um i don't know whether you've ever flown kites in india again you do it a yes. lot right in many festivals uh-huh. So yes. when you fly a kite, how is it that your kite doesn't fly the same height as somebody else's kite? And how is it that your kite today doesn't fly the same height it went yesterday? Because it may be a different shape. It could be a different bamboo that is there. Uh, you know, it could be a different uh, that glass that is there, the manja that we call on it, the thread. It could be the fact that somebody else is helping you to lift that kite off. It could be that it's caught a different draft of wind at that time. Whatever mm-hmm. it is. you are not going to be in the same space as the other person the other person is going to be different from you all you can do is to help the other person to recognize that you can show them the mirror to themselves but you don't know all the answers and i think that's why mentoring to me is as much learning as it is giving and wow. we have to recognize it that way. thank you and that's actually the fourth l so that's lekha <laughs> for all of you <laughs> that i am super impressed and floored by so really appreciate all the insights that you've shared with us all the examples and you've been a living example of most of them so uh, i mean i i i can only hats off to you because uh, having lost one third of the of the weight that you talked about as an example before yeah. which is <laughs> really really commendable and i think uh, you re- really should be showing the before and after photos i think for people I swear, who are seeing this yeah. for the very first time so <laughs> Thank you again Lekha and thank you Melinda as well for for joining us here in the studio and um, thank you everyone for joining us on Facebook. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Have a good day. The rest of the day for all of you in the west and have a good night those of you in India. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Bye bye. Hello. Was it okay? Hi. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think it went well. Yes. Melinda was really good. Thank you for asking those questions. Oh, so it's a pleasure. I wish I wish we had more time. Thank you so much. I could listen to you all day. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing all of that. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you. Bye, Kitty.